Well, hello everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the third of our lectures, uh, introducing uh, Mooting. Uh, greetings from very, very sunny Dundee. I'm glad so many of you have been able to join this afternoon for the, the live session. And for those of you who are listening to the recording, we're going to have lots of interesting stuff to, to, to cover today. So you can see we're all dressed up. Um, I've even got my, my wig here. Uh, and this is because once we do the lecture, we're all heading over to the, to the Moot courtroom uh, at Dundee Law School. And we're actually going to record an actual Moot uh, so you can see what happens in practice. So uh, I will be the judge, and then the, the four voters will, will, will be arguing a case, uh, and Libby will be the court clerk. So that will give you uh, an excellent insight as to how to do the moot, uh, and will reinforce what we're going to be doing in the workshops in the coming weeks. A big shout out, uh, thank you to all the schools that have responded in respect of the times that you, you, you'll be available for, for the uh, uh, workshops. Uh, if you've not got back to us yet, please do so. And, and please do offer us uh, a number of, of alternative times. Um, we're doing our best to sort of put schools together in times that work for both or three schools. Uh, and then we'll be starting the, the workshops uh, next week. So that's it for me. I'll pass over to Libby in case she has any other housekeeping issues to, to deal with. Peter, thank you very much indeed, and, and that was a great reminder. So that was my key thing today was to remind uh, those of you that haven't yet got back to us about uh, available times um, for the workshops, and please, please do. Um, you can email me direct or message me through WhatsApp. I think I've been in touch with you all. Um, I'm not quite sure how the students are planning on running this event today, so I'm not going to bother you with uh, you know, instructions about Q and A's and chats because I think they have all sorts of things up their sleeves. So, without further ado, I am going to hand you over to the team at the University um, of Dundee Law School, and um, over to you guys. Hi, everyone. I think we're there. We are. We're just waiting to get the PowerPoint sorted and set up. Um, so this week we're going to be talking about legal research and writing skills. So that is finding things to use for your moot, how to write a good submission, things like that. And then next week we'll speak about presenting that submission. So your oral techniques. So this week the learning aims are to be able to read a case report. A case report is in the name. It's a report of a case um, that several different institutions write up. Um, to understand where the law is, where you can find the law, and um, to identify whether a case is binding or not, if it's persuasive, or if it's been overruled completely, to be able to construct strong legal arguments from these cases, and then to understand how to create a bundle and skeleton argument. If you're not familiar with those words yet, or you can't quite remember, we'll go through them, don't worry. So a quick recap from last week, mooting is a competitive mock court appeal case. The teams in the moot present submissions for each party and they want to persuade the judge that their interpretation of the law is correct. It's not a um, case, it's not an issue of evidence, it's an issue of the law and how the law has been applied to the case. Um, each moot has two teams competing against one another and that the winner will be decided on the advocacy skills and the legal knowledge. You can lose the law on a moot, um, but you could still win the moot. Um, and during their argument, students will be asked questions by the judge, or it's called sometimes judicial intervention. So how is it marked? We uh, ran over this briefly last week, but the judge will consider several things when deciding who's won. The analysis of the law and the problem, the structure of the argument, oral presentation, like I say, we'll deal with next week, the teamwork, the relevance of, of authorities. You might be thinking, how can a judge judge teamwork? They've not seen what's been going on behind the scenes. It is quite easy for a judge to tell if the team has been working cohesively, if they're making, you know, backing up points made in different teams, a judge will be able to tell. Um, the relevance of authorities, the speaking skills and use of etiquette, response to questions, effectiveness of rebuttals and use of time. Those last ones we'll all cover next week in the presentation on oral skills and oral advocacy. But the main ones we'll be going through today are analysis of the law, the structure of your argument, your teamwork and the relevance of the authorities you use. So if you would all like to jump on to Menti, we'll give you a couple of minutes. 
Um, let me know if there are any issues with this in the chat. You should be able to just get in and put the code in. And then we have a couple of recap questions. Um, we're just going to be going through the first two questions just now, but keep it open because we'll uh, be using it more later. Um, let me know in the chat if anyone's having issues or if anyone has managed to get on it. Fab, I can see some people jumping in. I'll give you some time. Don't want to start without anyone. So what Menti is, is it's just a way for us to ask questions. It's anonymous. It's a way for us to ask questions and then get answers. So we can just kind of test, see you guys, uh, if you guys understand. And it's a bit of an interactive way to um, test your learning. Just give a few more minutes because we've still got people coming in. <laughs> um, I'm just going to pop the code in the chat as well. And copy and paste it if you're on one device. Okay, we seem to have stagnated on the number of people joining now. Um, so if we can, can you make it, can the question come up? Okay, so if you haven't managed to get um, onto it, that's fine. We will um, read it out as well and you can do this in the chat. But can everyone who has managed to get onto it rank the civil courts by heart hierarchy? So I'll read out the courts that are here. So we have the Court of Appeal, Civil Division, the County Court, the Supreme Court or the House of Lords, and the High Court of Justice. The results are still shifting around a bit. We're still getting some votes in. Okay, brilliant. So oh, we just, they keep moving around. Um, but the uh, general consensus is that the highest court is the Supreme Court or the House of Lords, which is absolutely correct. Um, followed by the Court of Appeal, Civil Division, again, um, correct. Followed by the High Court of Justice and then finally the County Court. Brilliant, absolutely correct. I think there may have been a little bit of uh, confusion around the County Court. That is the lowest court there is for civil cases. 
Shall we move on to the next question? Everyone's happy and there are no questions. Oh, so this is a case. You have two minutes. You don't have to read the case. You just need to tell us what court will the appeal be heard in? If you can tell from that, that's actually a moot problem. What court will the appeal be heard in? I think it says it a couple of times in the problem, just looking now. So if you are struggling, just have another read through. Oh, so we've got some different answers there, but the correct answer was the Court of Appeal Civil Division. Um, it said, I believe, once in the top right hand side. Um, and then top left hand side even. Um, and then once, I think it said lower down as well. Um, someone's asked what the highest court after the Court of Appeal is. That is the Supreme Court, or it used to be known as the House of Lords. Um, so County Court, High Court of Justice, Court of Appeal, Supreme Court is the order it goes in. Um, I think we're pausing on Menti for a minute now, is that right? And then we'll come back to it later, so don't uh, close the tab or anything. Okay, I'm going to be taking you through how to look at a moot problem. So in the moot problem, there will be the names of the parties, who is the appellant, who is the respondent. It will also say state the facts of the case, um, the court of first instance, and then the decision which was made at first instance. And then it will go through the grounds of appeal, and it will state that the court that the moot will be heard in. So the process of them um, approaching a moot problem is first to identify if you're the appellant or the respondent. So you'll be told um, which one you are. And then if you're the appellant, first you should look at the grounds of appeals. So that's what you'll be arguing. And then if you're the respondent, you'll be arguing against the grounds of appeal. So it's really important to ensure that you have a proper understanding of the main issues in the moot problem. Um, and then next, you should split the points of appeal and response with your teammate, as this will make your argument clearer for the judge and reduce your workload. But remember to be aware of your teammate's argument, as if the judge can ask you a question about your teammate's argument. So how to approach the moot problem. So first, familiar yourself with the facts of the case and grounds of appeal. And then you should 
take note of any cases or statues that are mentioned and look at them in detail as the judge will be quite familiar with the cases and um, mentioned within the problem. So you want to make sure you are able to answer any questions. First, next, then you should make sure you know which court will be hearing your case. And then uh, read the question, read the any cases mentioned in the problem. But it's also very important to read the relevant area of the textbook and note down any helpful quotes or case names that you come across, as this will give you a basis for your research. Um, but don't panic. Um, looking at the problem might be a bit overwhelming at first. And especially if you feel like the law is not on your side and you're struggling to create an argument. Mo the moot problem is on a certain area of law. And there is ultimately no one correct answer. But it must be said that moot problems do tend to lean on favour one side, but this doesn't put you at a disadvantage if you're um, on a side in which the legal argument might not be as strong, because it just gives you a chance to show off your legal creativity. So for the purpose of this competition, you'll be able to find all the cases um, for you moot within the textbooks provided and we all circulate the full case report for you to use, as well as the summary with the ratio of decedendi from the judges. But for each case you use, you should make sure to note down the facts of the case, so the party's names, the year of the case, the key issues and outcome. Um, furthermore, the, you should look at the court the case was heard in, the ratio of decedendi, and make sure you know which judge you're quoting in your, in your moot and make note of any dissenting judges as these will all help you answer any questions that you're asked by the judge. Um, you'll only be able to use four authorities. So you should make sure that you're using the strongest cases, so binding cases, and that they're a solid authority for your argument. So next on choosing your authorities, as I've said, binding authority is the strongest. And this is case law, um, which has been decided by a higher court and is therefore binding on the present court. And um, persuasive authority, you could also use, um, but this is case law, which is not binding the court, but maybe a persuasive merit. Um, for example, case law from Scotland, for instance, but do try and only use binding authority as it will carry more weight in the court and make your argument stronger, which is ultimately what you want to do. Um, a few helpful tips are to try and avoid statutes as these are open to interpretation by the judge and you want to make sure that your, ar your argument is, is not open to interpretation because that could go um, not in your favour. And then once again, make sure it's binding authority you're using. And if you are unsure um, if a case is binding authority, just refer back to the previous lectures on the court structure. And if you're still unsure, um, your textbook provides a more in-depth description. So in reading a case report, um, this is an example of one. So this is the first page of a case report. And at the top, you've got the names of the parties. There we are. And then you've got a brief overview of the outcome and the judges involved. And then you've got the facts of the case and submissions by the lawyers. And then the case will go on to the judgment. Hi guys, so uh, what we're going to cover next is a bundle. So a bundle is a collection of cases 
and or legislation that you'll be relying on your MOOC. Um, like we've said before, um, the main amount of authorities you get you can use in your bundle will depend on the competition and the rules and you will we'll be sending across the rules to you very soon and that will kind of establish how many authorities you can use. So during your speech itself, you'll be directing the judge to sections of your bundle by highlighting and tabbing. And you should make your bundle as clear as possible to allow you to easily direct the judge to the page you are referring to. In the past, it used to be physical bundles where you would get a, a highlighter and you would highlight and it would use up a lot and lots of paper. But what we're doing now is we're doing digital bundles. So you'll be able to send us your bundles digitally and um, we'll also be sending you an exact example bundle um, to give you some hints and tips on how to prepare. Now, what your bundle should also contain is your skeleton argument in the MOOC problem, and we'll be going over this very soon. And some helpful tips to remember when preparing your bundle is put the numbers on the tabs and put these in your notes so the judge can directly go to them. For example, if I was referring his lordship or her ladyship to a um, specific uh, case, let's say Donahue against Stevenson, because we'll be covering it later, I would make, perhaps say, uh, my lord, if you turn to tab A of the bundle provided, and it just makes it nice and easy for the judge to get at. Also remember to highlight the whole section which you're going to quote, so the judge doesn't have to read the whole page. So that means um, what that allows is the judge to easily uh, find out the quote you're referring to, and it does, it means they don't have to read the entire page to try to find out what point of law you are arguing. Um, now, how to create a bundle. So there are four key elements of creating a bundle. Your first one is the contents page. This is, this is just basically like any book, you're seeing where everything is located to give the judge ease of finding it. Um, the skeleton argument should be first. Then after that, the first page and the pages afterwards will be quoting from the authorities in, which, in the order in which you shall speak about them. So it's not alphabetical order or anything like that. It's very specifically what um, sources you're using first. So for example, if you're using Donahue against Stevenson as your first authority, that should be first. Or if you're using it as your second, it should be second and just follows on from that. Um, and make sure you highlight and tab the sections of the cases you will be speaking about. We will be showing you how to do this as well, so don't worry too much about that. Now we have circulated an example bundle and skeleton argument for you to look at and use as a guide. And an electronic bundle is made by compiling the cases into a PDF and highlighting them. And you'll be able to do that on um, any kind of electronic device. We'll also create and create a video on how to do this and include it on the YouTube channel so you can have a look in your spare time. Now, you're probably wondering what is a skeleton argument? Well, it's to give to the judge and opposition a brief overview of your arguments. That's actually quite important. Your bundles, they don't just get sent to the judge, they also get sent to the opposition um, and you'll get the opposition's bundle. It just, again, kind of creates the importance of a judge uh, for moot is respecting the other your opponents and it creates that respect where you're giving each each side your argument so that they can prepare for them and um, it just creates good court etiquette so yes what is a skeleton argument well it's a document which sets out the council's submissions and the case law and it's similar to a content page of a book now it should include a heading that identifies which party the argument is on behalf of. For example, are you the appellant or are you the respondent? It should include the names of the fictitious parties to the case. Again, bringing back to Donahue against Stevenson, in that case, you would be saying Don what party A is Donahue, party B is Stevenson. Um, which party is the appellant slash respondent? The court in which the case is held, for example, is it held in the Court of Appeal? Was it held in the Supreme Court? which party you are on behalf of, and the junior and senior counsel names at the end of the skeleton argument. Um, so that would just be, for example, to take me and Scarlett, if I was the senior counsel, it would just say senior counsel for Gilchrist, and then for Scarlett, it would say junior counsel. Um, now we have an example uh, skeleton argument, which you can see here. We'll also be sending skeleton arguments as well, so don't worry too much if you can't zoom in. Um, now, the substance of it is the overall grounds of submission. So if you look at, for example, the first one, it says it submitted by the respondent that there was no contract foul formed contract. contract formed with the appellant for a monthly supply of coffee beans. Actually, while I'm speaking, if, 
anyone that wants to say if you can here's a question for you if you know if you're looking at the skeleton argument and you can work out where the appeal is being heard just put it in the chat room box and um, what exactly do you so someone has asked what exactly do we mean by tapping that is just allowing the judge and the opponents and um, so it specifically says tab a so they can quickly go to tab a and it shows that page so it's kind of thing you can almost you can, think of it as chapters you can also just say can the judge you can refer the judge to tab or page six page whatever if um you can't figure out the tabs but that's fine um now, uh, there are no limits to the grounds of submission, which you can make on each ground of the appeal. So you can write as much as you want, but we will be talking about maybe why it's sometimes quite good to limit what you write. And um, also give the full case citation um, and the brief description of the argument. So some general tips for preparing your skeleton arguments. First of all, be brief, clear, and concise. The judge has a limited time when he's reading your skeleton argument. You want to make sure he knows exactly what the case is, why you're arguing it, and what side you're representative, representing. And um, make sure it's accessible and easy to read. Again, this might be important for making it brief, clear, and concise. Watch your word count and um, use quite a large font and maybe 12. That just means it's easy for the judge to read it and they're not having to kind of if they don't find it difficult to read it, something the judge is easy, finds easy to read and is able to derive your arguments very quickly. But make sure it's a formal document and um, you know it's my lord, my lady, and um, when you're referring to the cases make sure you refer to them formally, don't say them informally. Um, again, don't make it too detailed because you are giving um, your skeleton arguments to the other side and while it is important to show respect and you know um, good courtroom etiquette by giving your arguments and skeleton arguments to the other side. You don't want to make them too detailed because you don't want to, the other side to know too much of your argument because you do want to keep some of it hidden for the day. Do not exceed the set limit of authorities. This is really important. Don't be putting in a case in your bundle if you've already, if you've already got the maximum. And also don't put in a case for the sake of putting in a case. For example, if you're putting Take again, Donahue against Stevenson, you put in your bundle because you think it looks good, but you don't actually mention it. Don't do that. Only put into your bundle and your skeleton arguments the cases you are going to use. Include every authority you intend to use. So what you can't do is you can, um, again, similar, so you couldn't put in Donahue against Stevenson and not mention it. You have to only use the cases you use. You can also you can you also cannot introduce a new argument which you didn't put into your skeleton argument. So if you want to mention Donahue against Stevenson in your skeleton argument, you must put it in, or the judge will most likely reject it because you didn't in detail it in your skeleton argument. Again, um, make sure you proofread and ensure there are no spelling mistakes or grammatical errors and always end with a full stop. That's just kind of preparing you, especially for university. It's really important to make sure you've not got any spelling mistakes or grammatical errors. So just make sure you have a proofread. Make sure that your partner has a proofread as well. And that, that's really important, actually. Make sure you both register skeleton arguments and bundle because there's nothing worse if one of you is unprepared because it will be quite clear to the judge. Um, put your skeleton argument at the start of the bundle so that the judge can easily find it. So again, it goes contents page. So this is what's in the what's in your bundle and skeleton argument, skeleton argument, and then your bundle after that with all your authorities. And finally, make sure you've got the correct citations um, and that you've not put in the wrong ones by mistake. Okay. Um, so when how to utilize your skeleton argument. So first of all, what you need to do is look at what your opponent will be arguing. You may have came across their case in your research. If not, you should familiar, familiarize yourself with their cases. Um, like, yeah, so just to mention, you will get your opponent's skeleton and um, bundle before your MOOC begins. So that I think that's usually 24 hours beforehand. Um, um, that's usually what we do. So probably be what we do for the competition again. Um, so yeah, you will get your the teams, your opponent's bundle and skeleton argument, read through it. 
and um, compare their cases to the skeleton argument and come up with an idea on how they intend to use it. For example, if the opponents are using Donahue against Stevenson, you can um, assume that they'll probably be mentioning the neighbourhood principle and the duty of care and Lord Atkins. Um, so what that will mean is it will let you rebut your opponent's arguments. So you can start to come up with arguments on why the neighbourhood principle doesn't apply or why the duty of care principle isn't applicable in this case. Also think about what posing arguments are there. Can you incorporate them into your own skeleton argument? So finally, rebuttal. So rebuttal is where you consider the central argument and try to work out the opposing side may make on during their argument. And in the event that the learned opponent argues, the apparent respondent counsel shall argue in response to that. So it's making it clear that when the your opponents state the law, um, then you go back and say, well, this doesn't apply because of this. My learned friends applied, let's say, Don my learned friends applied Donahue against Stevenson. I submit, my lord or my lady, that this doesn't apply because of X, Y, Z. Okay, so here's just a little bit of an example problem. This isn't a full one. We've kind of just given you um, a very summarized version so you can kind of identify things. So if the problem concerns an individual who has been given sneakers by his girlfriend, some metal wire in the shoes caused injury to the individual's feet when he was wearing them. The individual sued the manufacturer for damages, arguing that the manufacturer was negligent because they had breached their duty of care by failing to protect against such risks. The defendants, the manufacturers, denied liability and argued that they did not owe a duty of care since the risk of injury to anyone buying the shoes was so remote that a reasonable person would not have anticipated it. So if you get this as an example problem, then the central question here is whether the manufacturer did or did not owe a duty of care. So in this instance, if I think the defenders um, won, so it would be the individual who was injured who would be appealing the decision and he would be arguing and the appellants would be arguing that there was a duty of care and the respondents would be arguing that there was not a duty of care. So this would be a breakdown of kind of a ground of response and how you would um, work through it and apply an authority to it. So the question is, is there a duty of care owed by the manufacturer? In response to the question, the respondents would say, the respondents did not owe a duty of care since the risk of injury to anyone buying the shoes was so remote that a reasonable person would not have anticipated it. But where's the authority for this? So we need a case, we need legislation, we need something that shows a legal authority, not just a random person's argument. <laughs> so in applying the case of Bolton and Stone, uh, heard in 1951, reported in the appeal cases beginning at page 850, uh, clarifies that to establish a duty of care, it must be measured against the likelihood of harm and what precautions were practical for the defendant to take in terms of cost and effort. Therefore, it is submitted by the respondents um, that they did not owe a duty of care and that they should not be held liable for injuries suffered by the appellant. You've kind of got to do this two or three times during your submission, and then that is the basis of your submission. It's just this repeated over and over again and you making your points. This is a very brief one, um, and here's the construction of a legal argument. So when you do come to write your speech, you will have your introduction, and um, it should clearly say what you're going to argue. Please do refer to the skeleton. If you put in that much time making it, just direct the judge to it. Be like, if I could direct your lordship to page one of the bundle, you'll find the skeleton, and then you can talk them through it, and then they can look at it, and it's just easier for you and them. And um, your introduction should touch on each argument you will make, um, there's no need to go into detail, but you should also explain to the judge what um, your junior uh, is going to say as well. And then if you were the first speaker, you will have to offer the judge the facts of the case and they'll tell you if they don't want to hear them, but you should offer them regardless. And then the structure, as I said, would be ground of submission, application of legal authority, and then how it relates to the current case. And you do this two or three times, and then you will come to a conclusion which is very similar to your introduction. Um, if you are the junior, then you will need to summarize what your senior has previously said and end the appellant or respondent submission. Um, so here is an example. So as we talked about, there was the ground of submission. So here it is, um, the 
foreseeability of risk of injury or harm is the first criteria the appellants will discuss. That's the submission. And then there's the application of the authority on the authority of Bolton and Stone. And then there's a quote. And then here is how it applies to the current case. So that's the basic um, structure that you should follow and make sure that you have that because without applying it to the current case, um, you've not got a very strong argument because we, the judge won't be able to see what argument you're trying to make. So please refer to this, uh, this structure and we will be um, circulating some example submissions for you to look at, but every booter has their own style. But as long as you've got these three basic points, then you'll be fine. Um, so as Peter had already said, we'll be doing a mock moot today. Um, and here's just a couple areas of the law and of cases that we will be referring to. So it'd be helpful if you could have a read of these at these specific pages, just get yourself familiar with them. If you don't have a chance, um, you can watch the recording and see if you can understand it. Um, and then I think in the first workshop, we will be kind of discussing through this area of law a bit more and, we, and you can raise any questions you have about our mock moot. Kelsey, sorry, are they the pages um, of the oh, tort law okay. textbook? It is the tort law textbook, yes. I will make sure that is amended before we circulate the PowerPoint cell. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and then we've also got some tasks. So we'll circulate the problem that we'll be doing in the mock moot, and you can just identify the parties, the decision, the grounds of appeal, if you think of any grounds for the response, because in the problem, you will only be given the appellant's grounds and the respondents will have to come up with what grounds they're going to argue, which can offer the respondent a lot more flexibility. Um, and then if you could briefly summarize the facts of the case. So you might be able to get some of those answers from the mock moot that we will be doing. If you don't manage to catch them, then we'll be circulating the problem and just try your best. Um, I think that's it, but we have probably got one more question, I think, on Menti. So I will just go back to the Menti slide. Um, if, if anyone was not able to log on the first time. And the code's in the chat as well, I believe. There we go. Um, so if you've managed to get on, there's now a question on who is the appellant?
Someone's just popped something in the chat, which is absolutely correct. And they've said that the appellant is someone who goes to a higher court for a decision reversal. Absolutely. We put the case on Menti that we're specifically talking about. If you could tell us, I think you can vote on Menti, who the appellant is in this case. Is it Jason or is it the Blue Shoe Company? Vast majority of people are absolutely correct who have said Jason. Um, it says at the very end, Jason appeals on the grounds, I believe. Um, and it's mentioned somewhere with the judge at first instance's decision. So really well done for that. Um, now on Menti, we are asking you, what words aren't you familiar with? Or what words are you uncertain about? Um, just type in any words that are still causing you a bit of stress um, and we will go through them in a minute. Um, if you have any longer questions, feel free to use the Q&A. Now's the time to get them out. We will be circulating the PowerPoint as well with as the example bundle and the mini moot we are doing. Um, the which should help out with your understanding it does tend to help seeing it in action Okay, lots and lots of great words coming in. Um, we'll take turns in answering them because there's quite a few. So I will start with dissenting. So a dissenting opinion, you can either have an assenting or a dissenting opinion. Um, and that is the opinion of a judge who is not in the majority. So if we are all judges, all four of us, <clears throat> and um, three of us um, agree to allow an appeal, to pass the appeal through. But Ruri decides um, that he doesn't think the appeal should be passed. Then um, his opinion would be a dissenting opinion and all of ours would be an assenting opinion. Um, a couple of people have mentioned appellant. The appellant is the one who appeals the decision. So in the example we just had, um, Jason was the appellant because he was um, the court wasn't in his favour in at the court of first instance, and he then appeals that to a higher court. Yep. So another question we've had is what is rebuttal? So rebuttal is where the opposing side um, rebuts the appellant about rebuts the, the opposing side. So basically, let's say Kelsey makes an argument as the appellant saying Donahue against Stevenson applies in this case because um, the, the neighbourhood principle is directly applicable. So I, as the respondent, I would be wanting to submit that that doesn't apply. So what I would do, and it's usually at the start of the respondent's speech, I would say, my lady, um, if I may take a moment to um, consider or to consider the appellant's uh, submissions, um, I submit, my lady, that uh, the appellants have used the case of Donahue against Stevenson. The respondents submit that this does not apply because of X, Y, and Z. So it's basically where you're taking your opponent's argument and saying why it isn't right and why it doesn't work. Um, and the, everyone can do rebuttal. The only people who, can, who can't do the rebuttal are the people who introduced the court right at the start, but everyone else can engage with rebuttal. And it's really important you show rebuttal because you are marked on it. So let's say me and Scarlett are moving against Kelsey and Louise and 
we don't use any rebuttal. We just kind of say our own arguments. We don't even consider the opponent's arguments. We will not get marks in rebuttal, and rebuttal is quite a significant mark range. So we would need to make a few arguments saying, well, the appellants have said this. It doesn't actually apply, and this is why. I think what's also key is when you really respect folks. So what, what not to do is I wouldn't go, uh, Kelsey doesn't know what she's talking about. She's completely wrong. Reject it. What I would say instead is I would say, my lady, um, my learned friend, Kelsey Laird, uses the case of Donahue against Stevenson. With respect, I submit that this doesn't apply because of it. So it's just being respectful, you know, completely showing that they're wrong and that they shouldn't have used the case, but doing it in a respectful way. Um, yeah, and you can also rebut preemptively. So if you have, um, if you are first in the court, you can say, my lady, I, the um, learned counsel across the bar will make this argument, but here is why this does not apply here. Um, we've had quite a few people ask what ratio decidendi is. Um, that is the part of a judgment that gives the exact reasoning for the judgment. So the judge will talk a lot in a judgment and it will give an, he will give an outline of the background of the facts. But the part where the judge gives the exact reasoning for um, their decision is the ratio decidendi. Um, and I think that covers quite a few of the things. Uh, case law. What well, case law is cases you use that have been in similar situations that you can apply to your current case. Um, so example a case on duty of care we could use Donahue and Stevenson and apply um, the judgment in that to the present case. And um, we've had a question in the Q&A it says making reference to the skeleton argument circulated under the list of authorities must we include the full case or could we just indicate the specific sections we'll be basing our arguments on and uh, I would say the, I think Rue's already said it, you should include the first page of the case report so that the judge is able to look at the, at the case and the facts of it on that first page. And then the entire page that you'll be quoting from, even if it's just a small section, because the judge would like to look at the context and make sure that you are actually quoting from a judge. Uh, we're not asking for the full case report because some case reports are 40 pages long and it's just a bit complicated to make a bundle that big. So yeah, the full page would, um, be enough, but please uh, quote more than just the section, if that makes sense. So uh, someone's also asked, what is jurisdiction? Now, jurisdiction is where the court has, so but jurisdiction basically means the court has the authority to act in this area of law. So for example, if it was a dispute between two companies based in England, um, the English courts would have jurisdiction to deal with it because they're both based in England and the English law would apply. Um, let's take an example where a court wouldn't have, let's say there was a dispute purely between two English companies in England, and one of the companies goes to Scotland asking for the Scottish court to make a ruling. The Scottish court, there are exceptions, but the vast majority of time, the Scottish court would go, well, we don't have jurisdiction, so we can't make a ruling on it. So when, when we say the court has jurisdiction, that just means uh, the court has the right to hear the case and make a ruling. You don't need to worry about jurisdiction too much because if we're giving you a case, then you can go on the assumption that it applies in the court that we're giving it to, it wouldn't be much fun if we can just say, right, okay, well, it doesn't apply because we don't have jurisdiction. So in the vast majority of time, the court will have jurisdiction and can make a ruling. Um, someone's asked, what is a lector? I think you're referring to um, last week when we spoke about um, almost what not to do when giving a moot. Uh, a lector is just someone who gives a lecture. So a moot shouldn't be a lecture, it shouldn't be a speech, it should be a conversation with the judge so you try, have to try and keep it engaging and um, things like that. But that's not a meeting term necessarily. Someone's also asked what are statutes and authorities. Statutes are legislation that is passed through the Houses of Parliament. Um, so that is acts, basically. So you might have in England, for example, the Offences Against Person Act, 
um, or things like that. That is what statute is. Authorities are either statute or case law, which is cases you use um, to argue the present case. So your authorities will be compiled in your bundle and that is your statute and case law. Um, so in answering the question that says, in the mooting competition, will the case be only specifically for a specific area, like criminal contract law, or will it be general? It's just going to be on one area of law, such as tort or criminal, so it won't be on a general area, so don't worry too much. Someone's asked um, what a treaty is. This isn't something you'll have to come across just yet, I don't imagine. But treaties are um, agreements made between states. Um, but don't worry too much about that. We're not going um, for international law just yet in the moots. Um, and someone else has asked what first instance mean. When we talk about the court of first instance, what we mean is the court where the um, case was first heard so you might hear the judge at first instance, um, and that means the judge who heard the case when it first went to court. And um, someone else has asked, what does dictum mean? So dictum or dicta, um, that what dictum is, is when you when you're referencing a judge um, in a previous case, for example, or take on who against Stevenson, you can tell it's my favourite case. Um, when if you're referencing Lord Aitkins, when he says the neighbourhood's principal, I would say, my lord, if I may refer you to the dictum of Lord Aitken at tab A. So it's just me saying I'm referring you to the court. So dictum basically means court. It means what the judge has said when they're making their ruling. Okay, so someone's asked why exactly aren't statutes the best form of legislation to base our arguments upon? And this is because they're open to interpretation from the judges. Um, and also just for the purpose of this moot, we aren't really going to be issuing any um, legislation. So just focus on the case law, which England is mostly based on anyway. Someone's asked when we will be issued the moot problem. Um, we don't have a specific date yet, but within the next couple of weeks, when you get to university, you'll have a week or two to um, do a moot problem, but we're gonna give you a little bit longer than that because you know you're busy and there are, um, it's all new, um, but it'll come to you in, a, in the coming weeks. Um, we um, will help you go through a moot problem for that, I think Kelsey mentioned earlier. And hopefully the moot we're about to record will be of use as well. Um, are there any more burning questions before we uh, finish up for today? Any of the um, words still in the word cloud that we haven't defined yet, uh, we'll make sure that we include the definition in the next lecture or in, maybe in this one before we um, circulate the PowerPoints. And someone else just mentioned what is a skeleton. Um, we mentioned this uh, in the PowerPoint, it's just a brief uh, outline of your arguments, a skeleton of your arguments. Um, but we will be sending out an example one for you to kind of look at. So avizandum means um, where, so when the judge is making their ruling, um, if it's a judge or more than one judge, um, they will say avizandum, which means the court is kind of dismissed and they go away and think about the answer. So um, if the judge says avizandum, it simply means that they're going away to answer the question, uh, to not answer the question, but to decide what the law, the applicable law is. And we will do that during our moot. What we'll probably do is when we're judging, um, we, we will hear all your submissions and then we may go away for a few moments to consider um, you know not what the, what we think the right law is but also what we think what team we think won the moot as well so that's what avizanda means 
brilliant. I can't see any more questions just now. Um, we will, if there aren't any more questions, then you guys have been absolutely great as always. Um, if you enjoyed using Menti, we will use that again. because I thought it worked quite well. We're still getting used to it a bit as well. Um, but thank you so much. And we'll see you this time next week. Right. Thank you guys. Bye.